All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice series. This is exam number six, where we're going to the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our practice exams and combo pack. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. 100. Which of the following scenarios most accurately represents the premac principle? So this question is essentially just a definition question, right? Because as long as you know what the premac principle is, you can very simply answer this question. And while this is definitely on the easier end of questions, it's a good indication of why fluency is so important. If you're fluent in all your terms, it just makes the test so much easier. So what is the premac principle? The pre principle says the opportunity to engage in a response that often occurs is used as reinforcement for engaging in a response that doesn't occur that often. In other words, it's grandma's law, right? If you eat your vegetables, you get to eat ice cream. So we're looking for the scenario that accurately represents that principle. A, Jason and Dana are riding their bikes to get groceries for their mom who promised them cupcakes for completing the chore. Okay, so do we have both sides? Do we have the opportunity to engage in a response that doesn't occur often? Possibly, right? They're completing a chore. We can assume that they low preferred response or with low occurrences. However, they're going to get cupcakes. They're not going to engage in a different response as reinforcement. And that's being pedantic, but we want to be as pedantic and as specific as possible, right? And so the reinforcement or the consequence needs to be another response that they get to engage in. And getting cupcakes doesn't necessarily qualify. So A doesn't quite hit the mark. Let's see what else we can find. B, all of Grant's friends are at the sports bar, which Grant goes to every week, but Grant can only go and meet them once he finishes writing an essay for his economics class. All right. In this case, the the low probability response, right, or the response that occurs at a low rate is probably writing the essay for economics class. In return, Grant gets to go to the sports bar, which he does every week. So we've got a low occurrence response and a high occurrence response. B looks pretty good. C, Jax claps his hands, does a jumping jack, and then spins in a circle all before reciting the ABCs. What does that sound like? To me, that's a high probability request sequence. Pre-map principle and high probability request sequence, don't confuse the two. They're two separate things. We are looking for the pre principle. And the pre principle says you can engage in a high occurring response if you engage in low occurring response. And B describes that. We have all of Grant's friends who are at the sports bar, which Grant goes to every week, but Grant can only go and meet them once he finishes writing an essay for his economics class. 101, I write out the name Seymour on a piece of paper and tell my client to trace the name. Wherever my client stops, I reinforce. I then make note of where my client stopped and try and reinforce them the next time for making it further than the previous attempt. Each subsequent attempt that goes further than the last attempt and receives reinforcement would be likely considered what? Now, let's think about this. It's a long question, but I don't think an overly challenging question. What, is, what are we asking about? What is the question asking about? It's asking about these attempts that go further than the last attempt and they receive reinforcement. So think about what intervention or what technology we use when we reinforce closer and closer attempts, because essentially you're trying to get your client to trace this name, right? And wherever they stop, you reinforce. And then we try to make it further and further. What are we doing here? What does that sound like? To me, that sounds like shaping, right? Wherever your client stops, you reinforce. You then make note and you try and reinforce them the next time for making it further until they can trace the whole name. So each attempt that you reinforce is considered what in shaping? A, a step in the task analysis. Are you conducting a task analysis? No. Are you teaching a task chain? No. You're teaching one behavior or one response, which is tracing. This is not a task analysis. B, an approximation. Yes. When we're shaping, what are we shaping? We're shaping approximations of behavior. And each approximation that's closer and closer gets reinforced and reinforced and reinforced until we meet or get to that final terminal behavior. So each subsequent attempt would be an approximation. Always read all of your answer choices. C, a generalized response. 
we're not generalizing anything here. Our response is tracing the name. We're, we're teaching that one response. Keep that in mind. It's a big distinction because it's not a task chain. We're not generalizing. We're teaching the single response, but we're shaping it up to little responses inside the big response. And then a non-contingent response. Well, it is contingent. It's contingent on them doing it correctly and getting closer and closer. So each subsequent attempt that goes further than the last attempt and receives reinforcement would be likely an approximation. 102, Dr. Burton provides behavior analytic treatment to children with autism. He conducts intake assessments, ongoing assessments, and trains technicians, as well as providing parent training. The financial agreement that he has stakeholders signed prior to treatment only lists the cost of treatment planning and service, but not the fees he requires for additional assessments and parent training. Is Dr. Burton acting unethically? Now, the mistake people make here is they have this long, complex, ethical question. They read it once, and they want to jump to the answer choices. Do not do that. We need to do all our work up front on the question. Not until we understand the question should we even think about answer choices. Ideally, we are predicting the answer. So we're looking at Dr. Burton. Is he acting unethically? Well, what is Dr. Burton doing? Well, he's providing treatment to children with autism, intake assessments, ongoing assessments, technicians, parent training, the whole nine yards, right? The financial agreement he has stakeholders signed prior to treatment only lists the cost of treatment planning and service but not the fees he requires for additional assessments and parent training. Now, in the new ethical code, there is a lot more business-specific ethics because ABA is becoming a bigger business. It's getting larger. This is important. And there's a, a ethical code for fees. And that code says every fee needs to be transparent and needs to be known the onset of treatment. Dr. Burton does not list some fees. That's a problem. So is Dr. Burton acting unethically? And as we go through that process, we've now predicted our answer. So is he acting unethically? A, no, the stakeholders signed the financial agreement, which acts as consent to treatment. That might be true, but Dr. Burton still needs to disclose all fees. He can't hide his fees. B, yes, Dr. Burton cannot charge fees for additional services. Well, that's not true either. He can charge fees. He just has to be completely transparent. C, yes, Dr. Burton must disclose all fees for any service he provides. That's what we're looking for. Dr. Burton is acting unethically because he's hiding fees. He must be transparent. And then if he's transparent and they agree, then proceed. But he cannot hide fees. Always read your answer choices. D, no, Dr. Burton has acted according to the ethical code and is not liable for the stakeholder's decisions. It's not true. You've got to protect your stakeholders. You've got to protect your clients. Taking advantage of them is not protecting them. It's not acting in their best interest. That is not ethical. So is Dr. Burton acting unethically? Yes, Dr. Burton must disclose all fees for any service he provides. 103, a foster family takes in a child who has been through numerous juvenile correctional facilities. Although it was not easy, the child is not in a good school and has avoided any trouble for almost a year. If the child continues on this path, you could say that blank was successful. Now, this is a teaching question, teaching you the distinction between these two terms. And the terms we're looking at are habituation and habilitation. And you want to distinguish between these two. What you want to remember is habituation is often associated with respondent behavior. It's the repeated presentation of a stimulus where the reflex or response to that stimulus is lessened and lessened. In other words, you hear thunder and you you jump, you get scared. The more you hear the thunder in that amount of that period of time, the less and less you jump. That's habituation. What we're doing here, or this family, is taking this child, right, who's been through juvenile facilities, and they put him in school and he's avoided trouble. So he's going on this path where reinforcement in the environment is being maximized and punishment is being minimized. And when we teach and change and help people maximize reinforcement in the environment and minimize punishment, we are habilitating. So if the child continues on the path, you could say that habilitation was successful. Now, obviously, you should read all of your answer choices, but this is more of a teaching question. And you really, in this case, I want you to understand the difference between habituation 
and habilitation. Don't get those two mixed up. Two very different things. Okay, moving on. 104. Grayson walks up to the ticket counter and says, two tickets to Oppenheimer, please. The ticket counter worker responds with, would you like to upgrade your seats for $5 more? Grant responds with, no, thank you. The ticket counter worker's response in isolation could qualify as what? Now, Grayson or Grant should be Grayson. Irrelevant. That's not important to the question, right? The name is not important to this question. So let's focus on what's important in the question, right? We're looking at the ticket counter worker's response and, and possibly in isolation. So remember, in verbal behavior, you have a speaker and a listener. And depending on what role you're playing, your verbal operant could be different because we try to identify verbal operants first by what evokes them, right? And then we're going to look at what reinforces them, approximations, those type of things. But you want to start with what is evoking this verbal operant? So let's look at the ticket counter worker's response. He responds with, would you like to upgrade your seats for $5 more? So what's the, the most obvious operant? Well, he's responding to Grayson asking for two tickets to Oppenheimer. And so that response is evoked by a verbal SD. It's a conversational response. Clearly, the first verbal operant should be an intraverbal, right? There's no point-to-point -point correspondence, okay? They, they share formal similarity, and it's evoked by a verbal SD. So Grant's response is first and foremost an interverbal. So we can eliminate A because interverbal is not an A. And so we have B, C, and D. Now, let's say Grant, remember, in isolation, his response, he just said, without Grayson saying anything, would you like to upgrade your seats for $5 more? Now, in isolation, if Grant wasn't responding to, or if the ticket counter worker wasn't responding to Grayson, that would be a request, right? He's asking for information. And an MO is evoking that request. So that piece in isolation without the verbal SD would be a man. So the ticket counter worker's response in isolation could qualify both as a man and an interverbal. Now, that's a confusing question, right? But verbal operants seem very simple. OK, until you get into like pressure situations. So this is just a different way of looking at it where we're looking at it from different angles. Right. Because verbal operants, depending on what evokes them and when they occur, they can be different things. So confusing, tricky question. Right. Understand how the ticket counters response could be both a manned and an interverbal, depending on when the response occurred. 105, Marco is sitting in his chair in the classroom, staring out the window, but minding his own business. His teacher says, Marco, you never pay attention. You cannot succeed that way. Marco now engages in disruptive behavior during class. The teacher's feedback acted as blank relative to Marco staring out the window and minding his own business. Very common situation, right? We have a, a, a child, Marco. He's just staring out the window, but he's not bothering anybody, right? He's just minding his own business. He's, he's not doing anything. Maybe he's not doing... I mean, he's not paying attention, but he's not bothering anybody. So the teacher, as a consequence, as Marco minds his own business, stares out the window, says, well, Marco, you never pay attention. You can't succeed that way. Now, Marco engages in disruptive behavior. So what's changed, right? Because the teacher, the consequence was, Marco, you never pay attention. You cannot succeed that way. That's the feedback that was added. So we know this is positive, right? Off the bat, teacher's feedback. Is, is positive because it was added. Now, how did it change the behavior? Well, what changed? Before, Marco was minding his own business. Now he's engaging in disruptive behavior. So Marco's minding his own business has decreased. Marco was punished, and his minding his own business was punished by the teacher saying, Marco, you never pay attention. You cannot see that way. So a positive and added stimulus punished Marco's behavior. So let's see, A, negative reinforcement. Well, we know it's not negative because nothing was taken away. It's not reinforcement because staring out the window and minding his own business were not increased. A is out. We said positive punishment because the reprimand was added and then minding own business was punished. So B looks pretty good. C, negative punishment. Well, the consequence was added, so it can't be negative. And then D, positive reinforcement. Well, it was positive, it was added, but it was not reinforced. Right, because Marco's responses 
for staring out the window and minding his own business. Okay, And minding his own business decreased, it was punished. The teacher feedback acted as, pos as positive punishment relative to Marco staring out the window and minding his own business. And then 106, Jennifer is sitting on the ground with her son, Ben, and holds up a yellow card. Ben just stares at Jennifer. Jennifer holds up the card again and says, yellow. Ben then says, yellow. What type of prompt did Jennifer deliver? All right, pretty straightforward prompt question, right? We're looking at Jennifer's prompting. She's with Ben, holds up the yellow card, Ben stares. Jennifer holds up the card again, says yellow, so holding up the card is the ST. Yellow is the prompt. Ben saying yellow is the response, so our prompt is yellow. Clearly a verbal prompt, right? We know that off the bat. So C, absolutely. Now. Is it a response prompt or a stimulus prompt? Because remember, prompts either act on the stimuli or they act on the response. Has Jennifer modified the stimulus at all? Well, no, she's just holding up the same card over and over again. She's not manipulating or modifying, mo modifying the stimulus. She's acting directly on Ben's response. So Jennifer's prompt is a response prompt as well as a verbal prompt. What type of prompt did Jennifer deliver? Both A. A and C, excuse me. All right, thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.